Welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim. Join host Dan Melnick and Kasim Masood as they explore big ideas, limitless possibilities, and engage with visionaries, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who dare to dream big, get inspired, motivated, and find practical tips for personal growth. Think big, dream bigger, and ignite your potential. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Guest today, Scott Putnam. Scott, please tell us where you are in the world and uh, what you do for a living. What's going on behind you? Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, live in Dubuque, Iowa, right on the Mississippi River, kind of a tri-state area, and developed a product called Swat and Scoop, which started really as an answer to a dad with two young daughters that don't really like bugs. So I would hear that scream that's like a certain pitch, like usually only dogs can hear it, but <laughs> it's like, oh, that's the bug scream, you know? And I'd go running in there as a as a dad wanting to be the superhero. The, the challenge was trying to figure out how do I get that big spider off the wall and back outside alive. So I created a swatter that has a built-in scoop, which essentially allows you to scoop bugs, creepy crawlers off of walls and flick them back outside alive. They don't want me to kill anything. So mm. my most recent baby here. That's awesome, man. So how long about did you kind of come up with the idea? And then how long was it between like the inception of the idea in your mind and then like when the actual launch was? Yeah, great question. So originally the idea, and I was looking back at my notebook, I, I came up with some rough sketches and this, this product's gone through a lot of different iterations, but the initial like, okay, I need a product that can scoop bugs off walls and get them back outside was around 2018. And then it went through a few years of iterations and some engineering. So we just really just launched it a couple of years ago and originally got it into retail and more recently on Amazon. Oh, awesome. How has the Amazon sales been? Yeah, it's been good. You know, I'm, I'm kind of new to Amazon. So I'm learning about doing ads and the keywords and kind of tweaking things and getting that all dialed in. But I've had some good help. So it's been exciting to see, see it really start to take off and obviously it's it's kind of a seasonal product people start thinking bugs in spring so um, we're just now really starting to see see sales start climbing again which is yeah, exciting. That's awesome i guess that's true i didn't really think that it would be like seasonal i guess it's like i guess it's kind of like three seasons though it's probably just like a little very slower in the winter time kind of feel yeah it depends on where you live i mean yeah. we're in the midwest where it gets just insanely cold and the bugs kind of disappear but throughout winter it's always interesting because i get a lot of orders from like florida and south carolina and yeah. just you know warmer california nevada arizona a lot of the warmer climates that have more bugs year round yeah that's awesome so their experience at amazon people have a lot of different takes when they first start to work with amazon it seems to be a monster sometimes it's like it's the best thing I've ever done. Sometimes it's like, I wish I didn't because now my traffic's there. I wish it was just like to my website or something. So the, what has kind of been your take and your experience? And do you also do you do your own fulfillment and just sell on Amazon or are you using Amazon's fulfillment services too? You know, yeah, we started out doing fulfillment by Amazon, but quickly realized that due to the length of the product, we were paying for like the more premium, larger box shipping. Oh, man, so it was just a, I'll call it kind of a rookie mistake. I mean, it could have changed the mold to make it a couple inches shorter, but I'm really happy with the length. So I ordered one from Amazon just to check it out. Like, okay, what is this going to look like? And it came in this like gigantic box and it's I like think a nine iron. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I was paying for that size of box and up to like 50 pounds or something. The thing weighs three ounces, right? It's really not that big. So it wasn't penciling. So I just switched over to fulfillment by Am or merchant fulfilled, which has been a lot better. Mm -hmm. You know, Amazon has their monthly fee plus the, I think they take about $3 per order, but you know, it's the largest marketplace in the world. So, you know, a lot of buyers there and setting it up, I hired a company to help set it up because I, I know that you have to know a lot with Amazon and you want to get it set up the right way and have all of the premium content and just get everything dialed in. And we do have 
patent, a pat, it's patented product. Plus we have a trademark so we can get that extra protection on Amazon too. Yeah, that's awesome. And yeah, Amazon, Amazon can be kind of weird because it's not like your typical like search engine optimization where it's like the amount of places the name exists and you know, you can kind of like pay to be like upfront there. Amazon has its own kind of like optimization niche where it's like, you really got to, you either know all about it or you know, basically nothing if you try to set it up on your own. So, but so, yeah, that, that sounds pretty good. And I've, I've heard a lot of people kind of, again, like you like start with the, the Amazon fulfillment services and then try, kind of figure it out on their own for various reasons. So that makes sense. And you know, what's funny is if think about a product like this, I always wonder, like I order things and they come in these like very large packages or, or like, or maybe they don't, but like, it'll come in like a few pieces and it's like there's there's no reason why like i will never have to take this back apart like why is it coming in three different pieces but that's probably why and it's very interesting it's like you know maybe like the handle like came off of like the end so you could put it in a more like a you know, smaller like square box that is an answer to that question i was always, always asked myself like why is this thing that i wear it's ten dollars that's why why is it in nine pieces i have to assemble this thing like why <laughs> yeah um, but yeah that's interesting so have you messed around with like doing like a direct to consumer e-commerce site at all or did you kind of just go obviously right to wholesale i think was the first thing you mentioned and then you kind of just went to amazon from there yeah you know originally we went right to retail and so mm -hmm. we're in about i think we're close to 800 retail locations now focused nice. mainly on farm and fleet some independent hardware stores ace hardware things like that mm -hmm. but we do have it also on our website it's just swat and scoop.com and so that was how we actually started with the online or e-commerce is just from our website and just get the email, fulfill the orders through our WordPress site. Mm -hmm. So we have the WooCommerce and just shipped them out. I'm still shipping them out myself, but yeah, that, that's how we started and just kind of networking through social media a little bit with my LinkedIn community. And um, I do product development coaching as well. So I, oh, cool. I really, I like to help other inventors get their product ideas off the ground and I get them out there too. So it's, it's cool. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I've had, I think it's just more coincidental. I've had a lot of conversations this week around you know, the people that have come on the podcast around uh, you know, patenting and trademarking and the kind of like, you know, legal protections you have to set up for yourself when you have like a really novel idea and you, like unique product like yours is. So yeah. it sounds like, you know, you, you said this is your most recent baby. It sounds like you've done some other products as well. So what would be like your best piece of advice for somebody looking to get into, you know, the space of, like of doing like an invention style, like new business rather than maybe like, a, like a, just a brand and a commodity that like, you can't really necessarily like trademark or patent completely. Like what, what would be your, like your first piece of advice or, you know, to somebody maybe newer entering the space? Yeah, it's a great question. What, what normally happens is that people come up with a, a great idea and they immediately immediately want to protect it. So they run to the attorneys and attorneys are great. They're good salespeople. They're usually happy to take your money. Yeah. <laughs> so you get it. Let's say you even get a utility patent filed. Then it's like, well, what's next? The attorney is like, I don't know. My part's done. You know, go get them, tiger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So people go online or they, they, people can spend a lot of time and a lot of money trying to figure it out. So I always recommend doing a lot of research first because it's free. You really want to become an expert in your category. You want to know what are the other products that are out there? What are the price points? How are they packaged? You know, looking at Amazon, look at all the reviews for other products that are similar to yours. And look what people are saying, especially like the two, three star reviews. You get a lot of good information. Mm -hmm. You know, I see, I see a lot of people say, wow, I love this product, but I wish it had this, or I, I don't like the handle. It's just not comfortable or whatever. So if somebody has usually the inventor mind, you know, we're, we're creatives, right? Ideas just kind of bubble out of us. And hopefully people are keeping a journal of that stuff. But if you're thinking about a multiple, you know, variety of products that you're kicking around, just start with the research, really become the expert, know the products look at the reviews for other similar products, look at Google patents. It's an easy place to search, try different search terms. The other thing I've mentioned too is have an idea of, am I, there's really two paths. You can license the product where a company takes it on, they pay you a royalty while you're on to the next product, or you're going to venture it. So you're bringing it to market yourself. The first way is typically quicker, easier, mm -hmm. less investment, less time. For people that have a lot of good ideas, it's a good model because you can get products out in front of companies quickly. The other way is going to be more expensive, slower, potentially a higher payout for you, but it's also a lot higher risk. So yeah. just good to think about that stuff. So. Yeah, that's fair. And what is your, uh, your uh, I feel like you're venturing this. Is, is, that, is that true with, with this product? Yeah, yeah. I've licensed a few other products. This one I didn't plan to 
come out of the gate venturing it. I, I followed the, the licensing model that I help people, that I coach people through. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've been coaching with product development for almost eight years, worked with close to 600 people with one-on-one coaching. So that's awesome. I'm real familiar with the process. So I, that was my world. I'm like, okay, I know, I know how this goes and got in front of a lot of companies, got a lot of feedback. People are like, wow, this is really something new. We really like it but we really need a sample like that we can actually use. Now at that point, I just had some 3D prints that I got from the library because they had a little maker space and it's like very fragile. Like you wouldn't, if you smack something, it would just shatter. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm sending it out to companies and they're like, do you have anything we can actually really try out? And so I thought, I'm going to look into that. I mean, to get an actual working prototype, you know, I would need to spend the money on molds and have the right material and all of that. And I I had a a friend whose brother has been importing from China for a long time. And he happened to be over and I showed it to him and he's like, wow, this is really cool. What are you doing with it? I said, oh, I'm following the licensing model and explained all that. And he said, why don't you just venture it? I said, because that sounds kind of expensive, man. (laughs) and I've never done it. So he's like, oh, I've been doing it for two decades. Well, let me help you out. I'm like, awesome. So once I found out I could have molds in China made for 3,500 bucks instead of 50 to 80,000, right. whatever, just this numbers are crazy in the US. But and then, you know, when I found out the patent wasn't going to be insanely expensive, all of a sudden things started lining up. And I'm like, you know what? Part of this is curiosity. And part of it seems to be the universe saying, hey, go for it. So I just jumped in. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's always so interesting to me interviewing and doing podcasts with you know entrepreneurs all day, every day is like, yeah. even somebody as seasoned as you, you've, you've consulted over 600 people like in entrepreneurship, how to use a licensing model. Now you're onto a venture project for the first time. It's like, you're still learning. You're still doing things for the first time. Learn as you go along, taking the help, finding people to support you. I mean, you know, that's such a recurring theme of, you know, what we talk about on the pod and like even somebody as seasoned as you, I think it's like, I think it's really illuminating for people to see like somebody who's been so successful as you as an entrepreneur, you know, still obviously you know, learning a lot of things for the first time. What would you say to somebody like starting off on their own for the first time, or even maybe a more seasoned entrepreneur, you know, getting into something new, kind of like you are now based on everything you've learned over the years doing the licensing and now in venture, you know, what would be like a piece of advice you would give anybody that's like looking to start out in that space? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because I coach people that are either seasoned business people or seasoned medical professionals. And I think a lot of us go into it with kind of this wide eyed romantic view that everything is just going to be easy. And, you know, the yellow brick roads just going to be laid out before you. And there's so many things I could suggest here. I think one of the big things would be don't fall in love madly, deeply in love with your product where you're willing to do whatever it takes, even if that means bringing down the house to do it. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that, though, is if we can be a little bit objective with our ideas, because a lot of the times we, you know, we, our ideas like our, our baby, right? We're like, don't say anything. You know, nobody wants to hear the baby's ugly. But when you're starting out, especially if you have multiple ideas, be objective, take in any feedback you get seriously and really take it into consideration. And it, like I mentioned before, you know, starting out, do a ton of research, really research the crap out of your ideas. I mean, hours and hours digging, looking at Google images, Google shopping, Amazon, Google patents, going into stores, seeing where it would be in the store. How would it be packaged? What would the price point be? What are the colors and fonts of other products in that category? What do those look like? And then I would follow a licensing model first because what you're going to get from that is you're going to get some feedback from companies that this is what they do all day long. If you have a new type of carrot peeler, and you're calling companies that sell a lot of housewares and a lot of kitchen and food prep items, those people are in that world all the time. So it makes all the sense in the world to, to get some feedback from them and take that. You could take it with a teeny grain of salt, but also don't, again, the baby, take it as really high value information. And not if you get one person that says, oh, I think that handle's too big and everyone else seems to be fine with it, you don't have to immediately change it. But if you get five companies that say, hey, this is cool innovation, 
looks like the handle is going to be too big, too expensive. We'll take that into consideration. Yeah, there's so much data and information out there, obviously, now that you can use. I mean, you know, if you're looking to get into use the I like the carrot peeler example, like you could look yeah. at a thousand carrot peelers and a thousand websites. And like, again, you know, like you said, go on Amazon, look at the two, three star reviews, like see what the big problems are and people that are already making this. Like if, if you can't figure out, like if you know it's something you want to do, but maybe you can't really pinpoint like what exactly is like the biggest issue that you could like innovate and change. Uh, that's a perfect way to find it. I think as far as from like an operative and logical like development standpoint, but also from a creative standpoint, it's a really good way, you know, using those kind of channels to you know, maybe innovate something that, you know, wasn't a part of your original idea, but you, you could certainly add in in the product development world. So, and then, you know, when you think about obviously, you know, you've done plenty of licensing ventures and you've consulted people on doing this. What's kind of, what do you find is kind of the best way to get in touch with and identify even, you know, what kind of companies do you think would be interested in uh, licensing a product you have an idea for? Yeah, great question. A lot of it has has to do with I like to start with going in the stores. When you're in the store, let's say we'll stick with the carrot peeler example. You go into Bed Bath Beyond or Target or Walmart, any of the big retailers, and you find where that product is in the store, and you just look around at the other products that are within like a three or four foot radius. You're going to start seeing a lot of brands, OXO, for example. Mm -hmm. You're going to see just all of the brands that have distribution where you want to be. So you want to be in Walmart, you want to be in Target, Bed Bath, whatever. Go there first because those companies that have those brands that are already there already have all that distribution. And then all, obviously online, Google Images is a good place to start. Google Shopping is great. Amazon. You're going to see a lot of brands. And then you just start your list of companies. And when you reach out to them, you want to do it the right way. You know, you want to have good marketing materials, you know, one page sell sheet, a video that can show it in action, you know, show that magic, mm -hmm. really keen into your point of difference. And then you want to get some protection. I usually recommend people get a provisional patent application. It's cheap. It's quick. You know, it's good for a year. You can legally put patent pending on your sell sheet and just start calling companies and try to get to the marketing people. And LinkedIn is a great tool for connecting with people and just start getting some feedback. Don't worry if you get a bunch of no's. That's part of the process. You're collecting no's and, you know, you got to have a little bit of thick skin, especially if it's your baby, you know. Mm -hmm. and, but what happens to a lot of inventors is, they're so freaked out about opening the box and showing their product to anybody that they just don't, or they feel like they have to get a full-blown utility patent before they can even share it. But provisional patent application is great. You can have companies maybe sign an NDA if you hadn't gotten a, a PPA. Uh, but the worst thing is to have your brilliant idea live and die in your mind and in your computer. No, yeah, no, I, I think that's I think that's really good advice. And you know, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, most people, I, I would say, most of the people that come on, they do go for like full-blown utility patents. And I don't think that's probably not necessary, especially on, I mean, it depends what it is, I guess, right? Like if you're three, four years into a, into a venture project, that there probably is something something you want to pursue at some point. But if you're looking at more of like the lic licensing avenue, provisional is probably the best way to go. And it's not something, you know, I've really delved like this deep into, uh, you know, the different mm -hmm. options that are available out there, the cheaper way to, ways to do it and like which thing is more appropriate based on the type of venture that you're on here. So I think that's really interesting insights. I mean, you know, we have a lot of like young entrepreneur listeners and I think that's really good advice and very, you know, insightful for those folks. So, so let me ask you this. What was kind of your last, before you got onto this, this venture project with this brand, what was your last uh, licensed brand that you worked on? Yeah, great. Great, great question. So I've gotten a, a few licensing deals in, in various categories. Some people say, hey, if you have success in one category, just stay in your lane and just stay there and just keep inventing. And some people have a lot of success with that. I see opportunities everywhere. So I'm like veering all over the road. So the last one was actually a, a fat, a low pressure fat bike gauge, like a fat bikes, with wide tires you can ride in the snow. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a really good low pressure gauge for those that connects to a CO2 cartridge. So did a lot of research, found out everybody wants this because a lot of times you switch from snow to maybe dirt or mud and then hard cement. So it's nice to be able to quickly change the pressure in the tires and they're wasn't a good tool for that. Yeah. So that was one that I licensed to a company. Before what was kind of like the turnaround time with something like that? Like where you had like an initial product and then and ended up just having a licensing deal and moving on from it? Yeah, that's a great question. That one was pretty quick. I mean, that was a couple months, but I would say the, the fastest that I've seen in coaching was a couple months. Even doing that, it can take up to a year sometimes. 
just because there's so many variables. Mm. I mean, just even getting your marketing materials put together, getting a prototype video, I mean, all the stuff takes time. Protecting it, even a, a provisional is going to take a two, three weeks anyway. And then you're reaching out to companies and you're waiting to hear back. So it, can, it varies a lot. It, it is faster than obviously than venturing, but it, it's a good model because even if somebody's thinking about venturing and taking it to market themselves, you're going to go through a lot of those beginning steps toward licensing anyway. So you might mm -hmm. as well get that feedback from companies because if you're venturing, you still need a one-page sell sheet, a video, you know, all of this stuff. The big difference is, like you mentioned, the IP. If you're going to venture, getting a full-blown utility patent is a good idea. I mean, you want to make sure that runway is clear and you've had a professional patent search done. Yeah, I think the big idea is, you know, like this is kind of the first time, you know, I'm really thinking deeply about licensing, you know, versus doing the venture. Only because I would say 99% of the folks that come on the podcast and that I do are, we have another like kind of interview series as well. So I think 99% of the people, they're venturing. They have this idea and it is their baby and they don't care. They'll do whatever it takes. And so that's the kind of motion that they go down. But the licensing side of it is not something that I think is kind of in the minds of a lot of the folks that I do that come on the pod. I think it's just more you know, circumstantial than anything. But I think it's important for people to know that that, that that is an option and that it's a very viable option, especially if you're the type of person that you had this great idea and you ran with it. But you find yourself having even more great ideas. It's like it's a good way to kind of get more like channels coming in for separate things uh, without having to necessarily do all that stuff all the time, right? For, for sure, it's a great mm -hmm. model for creative people that continually have ideas because you're not locked into one product forever. Mm -hmm. And the the beautiful thing is, let's say the carrot peeler example. You come up with your idea. You you know you work on some prototypes. You get your marketing material, your list of companies. Maybe you file a PPA, and then you're getting it out in front of companies. And you're you're getting feedback and sometimes that means you can tweak it a little bit but if you get a company interested it's so easy for them to just add it to their product line they have the salespeople, they have the infrastructure they have all the distribution channels already and then they're just you, know, you get a certain percentage royalty on the wholesale price so let's say it's five percent you know you're collecting five percent of whatever those they're selling it to the retailers for that's mailbox money while well, you're on to the next product yeah. on the golf course or whatever. I think a lot of people don't know about that model. They might have heard licensing, but they don't. Yeah. They think brand licensing, oh, like, you know, Hello Kitty or Nickelodeon or Disney or something. But product licensing is a big, big industry. And it's it's there's a lot of companies looking for ideas because all these inventors sort of become like product developers that they don't have to pay until they you know, land on a product. So it's a, it's a win-win for everybody. It's a, it's a cool thing. Yeah, it definitely seems that way. And I think a, another interesting perspective on this is you think of these big, like you know, giant distributors that have like thousands of products. They sell about thousand things in, in Target and Home Goods and everywhere else that you look. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but you know, just because they own it, it doesn't mean they have like 100% control and they're keeping every dollar. They just like own all these crazy ideas. They're more of just like facilitators of funds when it comes to like these like product licensing. I think people don't like, from the outside looking in, I, I don't think know that. So I think I think that again, I'll, I'll repeat it again. This is this is really important. I think for people to understand, especially as newer entrepreneurs, I mean, it's a, it's a very very viable option. I think for somebody who maybe doesn't have all the capital in the world to take on a venture completely, even though they may want to, and it might be their baby, as you say, you don't want to let it go. Yeah. But it may be a very viable option for a lot of people in a lot of stages of you know wanting to have their own business and be an entrepreneur. So yeah, that's yeah. awesome. It's a great point. I'll just jump in because a lot of the things you can do especially at the beginning, don't cost you any money. Mm -hmm. you know, you're doing the research, you're going online, you're, you're designing the product. If you get into engineering, you're going to get into a little bit of expense. Prototypes are going to be a little bit of ex an expense, depending on what the product is. So I always tell people to start with something simple. You know, if you got a carrot peeler and you got a hoverboard, let's start with the carrot peeler because it's going to be easier to get prototypes you're going to have less hurdles to jump through. So typically a simple product is something that you could put on a sell sheet and people would understand it. It doesn't have a lot of electronics, solar panels, enriched uranium, those kinds of things. You know, just keep, <laughs> keeping it super simple. And something that you feel like you could create a physical prototype and show a little sizzle video, show it in action, get that yeah. proof of concept would be good. 
Yeah, no, it's so true. And one thing I always like to ask this question on the pod, I know we kind of already asked, I, I wanted to hear your insights and like what you already, like advice you're already giving other people because you are consulting so many people already. But I always love to ask when it comes to like this brand as your first real like venture brand, if you go back to kind of day one, learning everything you've learned about all the, the other things you have to do when you are venturing something versus, you know, doing a product license, if you, if you go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice, like you advise so many others, uh, what would that one piece of advice be? Do you think? I think it would be learn to say no more <laughs> to because when you're starting out, you know, there's so much optimism and excitement and, and there's a lot of things that come at you. Mm -hmm. And so I was just saying yes to everything, whether it was like, oh, yeah, a marketing person. Yeah, let's let's do it and jumping into that and another opportunity to get some distribution overseas in Europe. Yeah, let's do that. So I was jumping into everything. And that's I think that's kind of a, a rookie mistake, in, especially when you're talking about venturing. So mm -hmm. I would tell myself, slower down a little bit, keep the excitement, keep the enthusiasm, because you need a lot of that. You need to know your why, and you need to have that excitement and that drive, but you got to keep your feet on the ground too, You know, stay grounded in reality and really think about it sequentially. You know, we're going to do one step at a time. So I was just, I mean, it was like just grabbing on to everything. <laughs> I thought, well, this is going to be amazing. And, uh, you know, I wanted to, to make it as big as I could, as fast as I can. And mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time and a lot of money that I didn't have to. And yeah. And, and I will say that is a very common answer that I get to that question from, again, most of the people that I interview are venturing the products that, that we're on and talking about. So I think it's a very common experience for somebody doing a venture for the first time, or it's their first thing they've ever done. And it just happens to be a venture. So, but you know, it is something really important for people to understand. I mean, you know, you do have to say no sometimes, even, even if it might be a big sale, maybe you don't want to take up all of your fulfillment capacity on a really low margin wholesale deal. And then, you know, you have to end up spending more money out of pocket to get your fulfillment capacity up to fulfill the orders where you actually are making the money on it, whether it's through your Amazon or your direct or whatever it might be. So, you know, you think like, oh, you get a call from Walmart, they want to buy everything you can sell. And it's like, well, that's great. But you're making five cents a piece. It's like, yeah, that's great. You'll get like eyes in front of it in the store and everything. But like now you're kind of back to square one with, you know, all of your products going out, not enough money's coming in, even though you're getting the awareness. And then you have to spend another bunch of money to do another fulfillment facility or pay for more production and manufacturing. So yeah. this is really important. It is. It, for sure. And with a case, like you mentioned with Walmart, with all of the things that they do with vendors, like you could end up losing money. Yeah. You know, selling millions of units, but you're actually losing money. So what's better that or having a handful of mom and pops that you're keeping some strong margins in and making. And that that's some advice that I got early on that was good is like, make sure you keep your margins intact because everybody, you know, the buyers you're talking to, a lot of them will, you know, they'll want to beat you up a little bit and have you cover shipping and hey, give me your absolute lowest price. And then there's other things that come into that that kind of chip away at your margins as well. So yeah, that would be another bit of advice is just hang on to the margins. Go at a good pace. Don't harpoon or try to harpoon a big whale when you're still learning to row the boat because they're out there, mm -hmm. you know, they're the Walmarts and the Targets. But for me, that was some good advice I got. Start with some independent hardware stores. Farm and fleets are great. Local grocery stores, start local and really get your feet wet and learn how to run a business if you're venturing. That's a, a big thing where it's path A or path B. Licensing, it's less about running a business and starting it. If you're venturing, you, you need to learn how to run a business, cash flow analysis, balance sheets, like all of that stuff, mm -hmm. which we don't think about. We're just thinking about like, Woohoo, my products in the stores. And that's a dream come true too. Walk into a store, you see your product, all of the stuff behind the scenes are less romantic. Yeah. It's the late nights and spreadsheets and just, okay, do you know how to run a business? Mm -hmm. And if not, it's learn everything's learnable. You just figure it out. And there's a lot of mentors out there too. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you do end up taking something like a really thin margin, like wholesale deal or something like it just kind of, it also kind of magnifies all those things that you might still be in the process of learning that now is like 10 X more work than it was when you were just doing like your, you know, maybe your local hardware stores and things like that. So that can kind of bog you down too. all the while you're making like really, really thin margins and you have to figure out how you're going to fulfill things that are coming from your other channels again. Right. So no, I think that's really, that's really insightful. And yeah, I just want to also just real quick, give you an opportunity to uh, shout out the 
the website again uh, any socials that you have you want to follow you or even you personally if you know, maybe young entrepreneurs want to get in touch with you as an advisor or anything like that just uh you know feel free to let people know how to stay in touch with you and how to stay in touch with the brand yeah for sure so our website is swat and scoop it's s-w-a-t the letter n and then scoop.com uh, we're on amazon we, there's a lot of socials. I, my daughters are now my marketing team. So we have oh, nice. tic, TikTok videos for SWAT and Scoop. A lot of them are super funny. That's We're awesome. on Instagram. We have a Facebook page that I'd love to see more people posting pictures of the crazy bugs they're finding and really build that up. If somebody's interested or they want to get in touch, like, you know, somebody's listening, they're a budding entrepreneur, or maybe someone that's been at it for a while and getting frustrated because they're trying to figure out what to do next. Um, you can email me, just scott at swattenscoop.com, S-C-O-T-T. Love to chat with you. Happy to you know answer questions and, and get people kind of pointed in the right direction. And I think that's one of the hardest things in the beginning. Like there's so much information online and where do I, how do I calibrate my compass to north so I can start navigating? So that would be something. And then I have a, a podcast too called Inventor's Edge that we haven't even launched yet. This is like groundbreaking stuff here. Nice. Exciting. Yeah. So check out an Inventor's Edge. And um, th so this is a little kind of groundbreaking info here, cutting edge, hear it here first. My daughter and I were on a, a show that's going to be coming out in the fall uh, that Amazon is sponsoring. Cool. That, and it's all about uh, you get 90 seconds to pitch your products that so we're pitching SWAT and scoop. So I'd say keep an eye out for that. That's Very all cool. I have like a gag order. So I, I'd love to share more, but just stay in touch. We'd love to, love to help people out. Awesome, man. Yeah. Well, great. Scott, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, thanks for being here, man. I really appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure, Matt. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody.